<laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that my $2,400 haircut is an experience, yes. And what you get for that experience is that you book an appointment. And how you book the appointment is you have to go through Jason. You pay a deposit. After you pay that deposit, um, <laughs> you're vetted, right? Because you're vetted. And then you come in for your experience. And for me, it's about the consultation. The consultation is the most vital in how we build our relationship as a client and as a service provider, how we build that relationship. And the consultation is the most important thing. Welcome to The Hairpreneur Show, the show that teaches you, the hair pro, how to work smarter so you can make more, work less, and live a purpose-driven life on your schedule, not your clients. I'm your host, Ryan Whedon, and each week I'll teach you awesome, actionable ways to tap into your personal greatness. Through marketing mindset and confidence training, it's time to unlock the next level of you. Let's grow. Hey everybody, Ryan Whedon here with the Hairpreneur Show. I've got two awesome celebrity stylists in the house today in the Mob Studio, and I just can't wait to pick their brain. We've got Ted Gibson and Jason Baki, two incredible gentlemen that continue to change and inspire the industry. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank thanks you. So thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. You got it. You got it. I mean, when I reached out to you and said, hey, I would love to have you as guests on my show. We've exchanged quick comments back and forth. I haven't had any like real sit downs or coffees or anything like that. And just how cool it was for you to say, wow, that would be amazing. I think you said I was a dream and I'm like, wow, you just made my day. So <laughs> thank you so much. I'm like, you even know who I am. This is so cool. Well, the thing is, is that I always tell the truth. And I think it's really important to do that, especially now during this time of what we have been going through, because everybody's going through, I don't think anyone is exempt from what's happening. So I'm really grateful to be able to speak to someone who has such influence as yourself. I know that Jason and I talked about what we were gonna talk about today, a little bit about our history, a little bit about you know where we are at the moment, and of course, uh, the future, because I think all of us really need to be thinking about what's gonna be happening for the future for our businesses in the beauty space, in the beauty industry. So. Thank you very much. Oh, you got it. And not only are you icons that we all look up to and we've, we've looked at up to you for years, just in awe of what you've created and how you're just always happy, always smiling. And I think that's probably one of the secrets to success. Like it really is. The more we smile, it's just hard to be upset, right? <laughs> As you say that, I think that the thing for me is what's really important is that knowing that everything is for my good, even when it doesn't necessarily appear to be that it's for my good, if I can live in the space in my head and my body and my heart about uh, knowing that it's for my good, then all I have to do is just smile because it does change the world. Mm -hmm. And just also watching how you both have stepped up as leaders in our industry during the pandemic and how we've been through a lot of BS in California with being called non-essential and then we're essential and then we're not essential again and how really there isn't any any real hard data that's pointing that we, our, our salons, the way we run them, the majority of them in California and probably of the world, is that they're very sanitary environments and they're very safe and they haven't been outbreaks for COVID. And just the way that you have, you opened against the state, you know, quote unquote laws, right? And, and you, I saw you getting written up with a fine and you were just, you know, we're just taking it. You're just like, we got to do this. this. We have to survive just like everybody else. We have to show that we are essential, that people do need to get their hair, <laughs> hair done. And, and although on the outside, it doesn't look like maybe because it's for beauty, it looks like a luxury service. But for a lot of people that come in to see us, we're almost like therapists. And somebody I was talking to, Gail Fulbright, she was like, we're therapists. <laughs> they need us, yeah, <laughs> especially do. during these times. So I've seen you, what made you want to stand up and voice your support for the industry? Well, I think it's just because we're badasses. <laughs> <laughs> well, that goes with that good. It's a given. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, we, um, for us, it was more about really making a stand for what our industry is really about. So it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the client. It wasn't about um, a lot of those things that were sort of like wrapped into the whole idea. It was more focusing on the, the science behind it. You know, like you said, there's no 
real evidence that salons are spreaders of COVID-19. We're actually, I think, 0.14% is what we're linked to versus restaurants are much higher, retail is much higher, and then the list goes on and on for where you're more likely to get COVID than the salon. Really, salons are at the bottom of the list. So for us, it was like, you know, I felt like Gavin Newsom, Eric Garcetti, and the rest of the politicians were sort of labeling us as dumb and dirty. Like we're not smart enough to follow the protocols and we, we can't create an environment that's clean enough and safe enough to protect ourselves and our customers. And I think that that's total bullshit. It's just not true. And so for me, it was really important to use the voice that we have combined to spread this message that, look, we're not dumb. We are successful. We're talented. We're smart entrepreneurs who can handle the responsibility of running a business safely. On top of that, you know, we're licensed, which either means something or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So if it means something, then we should be given the responsibility to stay open and conduct business under the protocols that are required to operate safely. If it doesn't mean something, then deregulate. If it doesn't mean anything, then why do we have to have one? You know, it's like we go through all of the steps, jumping through all of the hoops to get our license that certifies us in safety and sanitation protocols, as well as learning some basic haircutting skills. But we all know, like coming out of beauty school, you're not going to be a $300 haircutter. You know, that takes years of practice. So really, beauty school is all about learning the protocols to protect the consumer. So if that license doesn't mean anything, then why make us jump through the hoops, you know? Because if you go to a restaurant, mm -hmm. you're ingesting something from someone that isn't licensed. Putting it in your mouth <laughs> you know, swallowing and swallowing it. Swallowing it. <laughs> you know, I think that we don't necessarily think about that. And I think I do have to say that, you know, it can be, it's our fault as, as beauty professionals and hairdressers is because we haven't demanded, right? People in the beauty business, we haven't demanded the respect that we are deserved. So what ends up happening is, is that we don't necessarily understand our worth. And then the consumer doesn't understand our worth. And then it just trickles down to, you know, your mom and dad, when you tell them you want to go be a hairdresser, they're like, what do you want to do that for? You're not going to make any money. You're going to stand on your feet. This is my experience. Mm -hmm, sure. And how, lo and behold, how would they know that I would end up charging $2,400 for a haircut? You know what I mean? And owning four salons and having a successful product line and working on covers of magazines. You know what I mean? So I think that that is an extreme of what a license can do. And there's so many different things you can do. But I think it's our responsibility as hairdressers and as people in the beauty business to demand that respect. So as Jason's talking about that, the reason why the first time we decided that we were going to defy that order is because of that. Because we know our worth and we know how important it is in our business of what it represents. And as you were just talking about feeling good about yourself and all those things, yes, absolutely. But at the same time, we're worth being open because we know that we're not spreading COVID. Right. And I, I see that a lot of stylists do struggle with confidence issues. And they think that a lot of times they think that they just need to get better at techniques. And of course that is part of it, but I think a lot of them aren't doing the internal work or they don't know how to do that internal work. And it takes people like you, people like me to step in there and say, okay, look, working on your skills. Yes. You, you have to be very good at what you do if you want to be successful, but you also need to find ways to have more confidence to charge what you're worth to say, no, I, I don't think I'm capable of, of reaching your unrealistic expectations and end up having a, a unhappy one-star Yelper as a client, you know? We need to have that confidence. What are some good ways to teach a young stylist or any stylist that just doesn't feel confident to charge what they're worth? What do you tell them? How do you change their minds? Well, I think that for a lot of us in our industry, we take a lot of pride in being booked four months in advance. Mm -hmm. When I'd rather take a lot of pride in charging $450 every 30 minutes. You know? So, you know, Ted has a $2,400 haircut. He does one haircut to, you know, the guy down the streets, 24 or 30 haircuts. 
You know, so it's like, if you're booked so far in advance, raise your prices 20%, 25%. You might lose 20% of your clients, but you're still going to make exactly the same amount of money and be working a lot less. You know, so it's thinking about how to run your business more effectively by following those kind of numbers instead of running your business emotionally. Mm -hmm. I think that we, as an industry, have a hard time sort of separating ourselves from our work. And that's when the, when it becomes hard to draw the line when, again, it's our own fault. You know, we have a girlfriend who says, Hey, why don't you come over and do my hair and I'll get a bottle of wine and order some pizza and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, yeah, okay, that'll be fun. You know, but that, what that really does is it knocks us down a notch in professionalism and in our own, you know, worth, you know? So I learned very early on in my career that your friendship with me has nothing to do with your hair. If you want me to be involved in the amazingness of your hair, then you need to book an appointment at the salon. I'm not coming to your house. You're not coming to my house. You know, now, of course, that was a long time ago. And there really was only one place for people to get their hair done, which was in the salon. There was only one place for people to buy product, professional hair care products, which was in the salon. And now, especially after 10 months of COVID, um, the consumer is really used to having people come to her house because we all know that most people were still working, whether they were working in the salon or not, they had to, we still have to pay our rent, mm -hmm. you know? So, right. Well, I understand the simple mindedness of a blanket shutdown. The point that they're missing is people still got to work and pay their rent. So instead of doing it in a safe environment, now they're going to people's houses that they don't know and exposing themselves to all of these different elements within that household that is where the spread is happening by mixing households. So, wow, how did I get off on that? <laughs> I mean, it's a really great point. Because it's 2020 and that's just what happens. It's, yeah, it's, totally. It's really a good point, though. I mean, you think about it, the business has changed. And, you know, when about five years ago, we were kind of discovering it for ourselves about the business of being in the salon has changed where, you know, you would sit down after you do a haircut on a guest or color on a guest, you'd tell her, these are the products that I use. You would take her to the retail shelf. She would look at the product. She would get on on her phone and she would order them from her phone. WTF, what is going on? Right. And we started seeing this about five years ago. So it kind of like, okay, so something's happening. You know, the place where you can go and get your blow dry for $30, right? the place that you can go online and order your product. There were all these different things that were changing the dynamic of what the salon atmosphere was about. And we had no control over that. We either needed to shift with the tide or we would sink. Or stay ahead of it. Or stay ahead of it. So, so yeah, when we came to California, after we closed our New York store, we took some time to think about what it is that we loved about the beauty industry, what we less than loved, and how to kind of create the salon of the future with technology and thinking about the bottom, you know, the bottom line and what kind of expenses as a salon owner did I hate paying? You know, I hated paying hourly wages for five front desk staff and a front desk manager and a housekeeper and 12 assistants that each assistant cost about $25,000 worth of education to put them onto the floor. And then we had to pay them hourly while they were building until they met a certain amount to live on their commission. You know, it's like, how do we get, I hated having $50,000 worth of retail sitting on a shelf waiting for a hairdresser to sell it when they don't want to sell it and a consumer to buy it when she doesn't shop in that environment anymore. And so when we opened Starring, we sort of took all of those things and got rid of everything that we less than loved. That's so there's <laughs> no retail. The retail that we have, you can experience at the station or at the back bar, and then you order it online and it gets shipped directly to your house. So we're not warehousing product for the manufacturer. There's no front desk. So there's no one to answer the phone. So everything is booked through apps. We work with this, this salon booking software called Aura, who you know, is really forward in their thinking about the way that businesses can be moving forward post COVID. We don't have assistance. We don't specialize. So when a client comes to the door, we have, we're by appointment only. The front doors and back doors are locked all the time. So when a client comes to the door, 
the only point of contact that she has is her hairdresser that does her cut, that does her color, that does her chemical straightening services, whatever it is. And that's sort of how we built this model of, you know, luxury instead of being touched by 57 different people and then having to tip them all on your way out. We've defined luxury as like, you're only with one person the whole time. You're not handed off to someone else. We define luxury instead of chair, 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 one chair in what we call the cloud. So they're semi-private, they're eight and a half feet apart from each other. Through all of this redefining of what we thought the salon experience should be, we were open 11 months before we got shut down due to COVID. And that's when we realized, wow, we already by design have every single, we didn't have to spend a dollar on changing anything in our system because our entire system was built for one point of contact and a luxury intimate experience. The salon of the future. And we really had no idea that we really built the salon of the future. And we had no idea that the future would be like, you know, right now, 15 <laughs> weeks away. <laughs> you know? So this model, it's almost, aside from the times that you did have to close the doors and you couldn't work according to the state mandates, you've pretty much created the new model for something that can survive a pandemic because you don't have all those overhead expenses to deal with. And you can probably save a heck of a lot more money because you're making a lot more money net without having to worry about all of these payroll expenses and gosh, just everything that goes along with employees and retail products with, that you can't sell. And yeah, so this is, this was starring, right? This is starring. Starring, starring by, by Ted Gibson. Gibson. I absolutely love starring by Ted Gibson. When did this idea come to you? About two and a half years ago. Yeah, I think maybe a little bit longer than that now, maybe like three years ago, we were, you know, we, we created shooting star texture meringue, our hero skew from starring with the plan of having many more, but instead we opened a salon and then we ran out of money. And then it was, you know, anyone who started product lines or open businesses, you're know, an entrepreneur, you know, when we were launching shooting star texture meringue, we already knew that we didn't want to follow the traditional distribution model that we wanted to be forward thinking and we wanted to create something that was different. And so we decided to be the first luxury premium salon hair care brand to launch exclusively on Amazon. And that for a lot of people was like, oh my God, you're getting in bed with the devil. <laughs> now, there, were, there was a lot of, we got a lot of flack mm -hmm. from going right to Amazon. Probably got called a sellout. We get called sellouts more than we don't get called sellouts. <laughs> <laughs> and if by selling out, you mean thinking differently? So. Well, I mean, the same could be said for <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, I remember talking to David from Pulp Riot, you know, when he, they sold to L'Oreal, I mean, he initially got like, you know, people were calling them a sellout. I'm like, they probably got paid so much money. <laughs> it doesn't, they were just being smart. That's what you call being a business owner. <laughs> and to be honest, I think that that as a, as an entrepreneur, as a product developer, like that's the end game. Yeah. Right. The goal is to be purchased by one of those big brands because, you know, in our own experience, in my experience, I only know how to do so much. And then I need people that know more than me to take over, to let it keep growing, you know? So I have total respect for that sellout. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and the more, the more successful that you can be, that I can be, we're out of the same mind. I know that we're, we want to give back and we can help so many more people, the more successful we are, the more reach we have, the more money we have, the more money we can give out, the more scholarships we can give out, the more lives we can change. You can't do that if you don't have anything to give or if you, <laughs> you can't take care of yourself. <laughs> right. And speaking on that, I mean, what we did was we found out this year, especially that during the pandemic, we looked at ourselves and we said, okay, so the restaurant business had been well taken care of. Right. Their association, their association really talked about rest. I mean, you had Danny Meyer from Shake Shack on the television talking about saving the restaurant business and how are we going to save the restaurant business and raising all of this money and getting money from the government to save restaurants. Crickets about the beauty business. Unless it was something like, yeah, oh, those dumb hairdressers had COVID and went to work. And, you know, spread, and spread possibly the, spread to 150 people. Which, whatever. yes, didn't, didn't happen. spread it to anybody. It <laughs> didn't happen. But, you know, the press that we did get was not positive. positive. No, and nobody talked about 
the beauty business that house salons and barber shops and nail salons and lash bars all around the country were suffering and there was no help. There was nobody to really come and give them information or how to help them in a way. The Professional Beauty Association did what they could. Manufacturers did what they could. There wasn't like this thing that said, okay, we are here to help you, right? So with that being said, Jason and I, we looked at ourselves and we said, what can we do? What can we do? What can can we do? So what we did is we came up with a nonprofit called the Worth Up Alliance. And the Worth Up Alliance is a part of Beauty Changes Lives. If you're not familiar with Beauty Changes Lives, Linnell Lynch is a really good friend of ours, together this nonprofit about 10 years ago. And I was the first ambassador for Beauty Changes Lives. And it went like gangbusters, right? Because what the need was for people who want to, and she would be a great guest for you, Linnell Lynch, she'd be really good. Yeah. She came up with this, this whole idea of Beauty Changes Lives and how scholarships and helping people go to beauty school and in depth of what that could be for them, she created. It was so amazing. So Worth Up Alliance is a part of the Beauty Changes Lives family, but Worth Up Alliance is the next step of that. So ours is really about being able to help beauty entrepreneurs fulfill their dreams, whether it be opening a salon or launching a product or finding a space or whatever it is that a beauty entrepreneur wants to fill their dream, we're going to be able to be of that service. So our goal is over the next six months to raise about $300,000 to start giving grants out in September that we're super, super, super excited about. And again, if you go to theworthupalliance.org, you'll read more about it. And it's something that I think is going to be the legacy for, for, I'll speak for myself, for me, even after doing all of the celebrities and the salons and the product and everything that I've done, that I think the Worth Up Alliance is going to be the thing that's going to change the way that we think about beauty. We have had really great support from other professionals in the industry, from Rodney Cutler and Van Council and Joe Blackwell, and just the list goes on and on of people that are, you know, very high profile and very successful. Like Van has the Van Michael salons in Atlanta. I think he's got like 400 employees. You know, Rodney Cutler has three or four salons in the Manhattan area and has been doing, you know, fashion weeks with Redkin forever. And then we have like Jay Fisher, who has a salon and rents or is building out an education facility and salon suite facility in Northwest Indiana. You know, so we've got a really great variety. Mickey Wright in Florida, who's a business coach. Fatima Ampi, who's a Naha winner. All of these people have come together to share their experience and their knowledge to help create this library of information. And we have the first nine interviews on the website, worthupalliance.org, that anyone can go to for free and just hear what these amazing people have to say on certain topics about writing a business plan. Zan Ray and Tom Collins, also salon coaches out of Houston, Texas, they have, uh, they talk about how to find funding and the important steps that you need to take to, to, before you go to the bank and try and get a loan. We have Kelly Rucker in Southeast Florida talking about, I think she talks about finding a location and the importance of location, 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 you know? So all of the things that a would-be entrepreneur would have questions about, we're going to create content in this, in this video library that they can go to. The next step then for people, you know, there's going to be some people who see this series of videos and they're like, you know, they're like the YouTube learners that are like, okay, I got it. I can do this now. But then there's going to be some people who want more than watching the videos. And for those people, they'll be able to apply to have mentorship with our What are we calling them? Ambassadors. Ambassadors. Sorry, the word escaped me. Um, With our ambassadors to help, you know, get them through the writing of the business plan, to help get them through creating an employee manual, to help get them through how to find a formulator for their new product line. All of those kind of things that are really scary and big that a lot of people just don't know how to figure out on their own, we'll have coaching there for them to do that. Of those people, they'll be able to 
put together sort of a demonstration with their business plan, with their location, with their whole model, and present that to four judges from the Worth Up Alliance and four judges from Beauty Changes Lives. And we will be giving seed capital to these entrepreneurs, ranging from $5,000 up to $50,000, depending on the need, the location, you know, like in this, in central Iowa, $5,000 can go a long way for a build up. But, you know, on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, $5,000 is not even, you know, two weeks worth of your rent. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lofty goal of raising $250,000 in the next six months. So at the end of uh, like third quarter of 2021, we'll be able to start giving money away to help these beauty entrepreneurs fulfill their dreams. So exciting. Uh, that's amazing. So Worth Up Alliance, that's great. And I, and I would love Beauty Changes Lives. I have spoken to Linnell briefly before. And where was it? I was at one of the, I think the, the Wella Beauty and Vision Awards. And I was back there and they were part of it. And, and um, they gave Wella a lot of money for that. So for, as for scholarships and things. Or no, it was a, a reversed. Uh, that we gave it to, Wella gave it to Beauty Changes oh, Lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that Wella was their first really substantial funder. Like, I think it was the, that relationship was like a pivotal moment for Beauty Changes Lives. That's incredible. That's incredible. I just love to see how many more people are stepping up and there's more and more people doing what you're doing. You're trying to give back to the industry that's been so good to you. And if there's any way that I can help out too, to help you raise the money, I'll definitely contribute. I can't contribute 300,000 just yet. I'm not that rich yet. Uh, <laughs> one day, yeah. though, that would be cool. I'd be like, here you go. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, we'll look forward to that day. Goals, goals, right? <laughs> but anyway, but I would love to help out and get the word out for you as well. And if you need any help, I, mean, I could potentially be a mentor or something, whatever. I love to contribute my time for good call. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Definitely. But you guys just seem like such a power couple. You've been married for, oh my gosh, 25 years. And I know that was before it was even legal and, and you've stuck through the times and I'm sure you've just seen a lot of, a lot of good times, hard times overall probably wonderful times together and i just want to hear about well first of all how did you two meet <laughs> uh ted was my teacher in beauty school <laughs> all right all right i'm hot for teacher. Back, back back when it was okay right okay yeah, right exactly. <laughs> well it was in minneapolis and at the time it was called the horse education center for fashion beauty, wellness and arts yes yeah. horse reckerbacher the founder of beta uh, had an education. He, you know, of course, I was very fortunate to be able to work with him for about seven years of being in his pocket and really learning a lot from him. And I can say that 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 experience helped me. You know, I always say that we all need to find a mentor, regardless of what your age is, or a coach, and never to trust anyone who doesn't have a coach. They think that they know everything already. Then never they're... trust a coach that doesn't have a coach. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but that period of us and how we met, I was one of his teachers, of course, in beauty school. And the thing that I can say about that is that, you know, you can't help who you fall in love with. You just need to fall in love. And there's nothing greater than having someone who supports you that can handle the craziness of being an entrepreneur and being an artist, because we all are. And really knowing. I don't careful. know if he's talking about himself right now or if he's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been, you know, a long time that we've been together and we have built brands together. We have created an amazing life. And, you know, there, one of my favorite movies of all time is a movie called Mahogany. And actually, on our first date, I made him watch it. And there's a period, <laughs> there's a period in the movie where she is Diana Ross and Billy Dee Williams. And there's a period in the movie where she becomes this really successful fashion model in Milan and, you know, all over the world. And she brought him, Billy Dee Williams, to, to Milan to be with her for a second. And, you know, they got into this big fight because she felt like she was on top of the world and they got into this big fight. And he told her that success is nothing if you don't have anyone to share it with. So I think that that's a very, very good lesson for all of us as people and human beings, that having success with no one to share it with, it's not that successful in my opinion. Right. So making him watch that movie, was it like a test? 
Oh yeah. If he can survive this test, there's there's a potential future. Absolutely. <laughs> if he loves it as much as I do, then let's go. <laughs> so how how'd the next date go, Jason? Were you were you just like, okay, it's my turn. It's movie time. Let's do this. Uh, no, the next, the next day I was like, okay, you so did stay the night. Yeah, I did. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Again, and it worked out. <laughs> the next day I was like, so you're my boyfriend now. And Ted, Ted said, no, I'm not going to be your boyfriend. And I said, okay, well, I, I'm going to introduce you to my friends as my boyfriend and you can introduce me to your friends however you want to. And then that was it. That was it. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. I couldn't find it any longer. So we were together for like about how, how long in Minneapolis? Four more years in Minneapolis? No. Three years in Minneapolis? Yeah, yeah. And Horst said to Ted, you need to be in New York and you need to be doing fashion. You shouldn't be in Minneapolis. So I'll move you and Jason to New York. I'll give you a job. And I was like, nope, we're not going to New York. I like Minneapolis. I want to stay here. And Ted was like, okay. And then Horst asked him again. And then Horst asked him again. And Ted said, I don't think he's going to ask me again. And I said, okay, we'll go for a year. And we ended up being in New York for 20 years. and. You know, I think I like to tell that because there's a lot of times in our life or in our career where we're offered some really good advice and maybe we take it and maybe we don't, but I think it's really important for people to get used to just saying yes, you know, saying yes to things We're we were lucky enough to be friends with Joan Rivers and she told the story of when um, she was basically blacklisted from Hollywood and television because of whatever happened between her and Johnny Carson. And she was struggling. Her husband had passed away and she didn't know what she was going to do. Um, and this opportunity came along to sell nail polish on QVC. And that relaunched her into the public eye in a way that was totally different. And she said, it was such on the scale of my life, it was such a small door that anyone could have walked past it without seeing it. But I opened that door and it changed my life. It's the same kind of feeling that I get when I tell the story about, you know, when we were first in New York, if you were working in fashion, you didn't do celebrities because fashion was where it was at. Like fashion is where the trend came from. It was like Deborah Rose Prada, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you lived in LA and worked on celebrities, it's because you weren't a good enough hairdresser to be in New York doing fashion, mm -hmm. you know? And then the tide started, but the tide started to shift a little bit and we started seeing celebrities appearing on magazines and blah, blah, blah. And so Ted was getting a lot of pressure to work on celebrity. And he, and he said, I'm not a celebrity hairdresser. I'm a fashion hairdresser. And Lucy Sykes, who was the editor fashion editor for Marie Claire said, Ted, I know you don't want to do celebrities, but this is a great opportunity. You should say yes. We're shooting two covers in one day in London, uh, one for Cosmo and one for Marie Claire. And it's a celebrity. You should do it. Ted was like, who is it? She said, Angelina Jolie. And Angelina Jolie at the time was that weird girl who gave her brother an awkward kiss at the Academy Awards. And I wore remember that. <laughs> you know, she was not a fashion icon. And Ted said yes. And it changed his career. It changed our careers just by listening to someone else's advice and by saying yes. So I think that that's a really important thing, especially as we're now hopefully reaching the other side of the, this pandemic and business will there'll be a whole new kind of normal to our business from, you know, I don't know how old you are. I'm old enough to remember when we would go to the dentist and the dentist wouldn't wear gloves when he or she put that, it was probably a he back then put his fingers in your mouth, but then AIDS came around and, you know, it became normal to have people wearing gloves, the phlebotomist, like whoever. So there's probably going to be some new normal for us after this is over. Like, Maybe masks will stick around like they do in Asia. When people are sick, they wear a mask just because it's socially polite, you know? But it's going to take a little while for us to really regain consumer confidence and, you know, to let them know that we 
are a safe place to be. But we also have to remember that there's a lot of opportunity that came out of COVID. Like women are used to getting their hair done at home now. They, they can have get on an app and have somebody at their house in 30 minutes after they put their kids to bed and they can have a glass of wine and chill and whatever. So we're going to have to compete with that as salon owners. You know, I think it's, I think one of the things that we need to focus on is like focus on the services that are really uncomfortable to do at home. Like, don't worry about the blow dries. Don't worry about the, the single process color. Don't worry about the basic cleanup haircut or a trim. Like focus on chemical straightening, focus on extensions, focus on complicated hair color corrections or changes, focus on, you know, specific haircutting techniques that are that aren't easy to do. Like George Clooney was just on CBS Sunday morning saying for the last 13 years he's used a Floby on like the most handsome even man in the world is right. talking about cutting his own hair with a Floby. Like <laughs> we have to be be prepared to offer something that's going to be really uncomfortable to do at home. Because 90 days makes a habit. She's been getting on an app now for 10 months having somebody come to her house. So we need to think about how we can do the things that we do in a way that makes them feel special, makes them feel taken care of, and makes them feel like the money that they're spending is worth it for the experience. Yeah, because it's really that. You know, it is the salon is going to be the place where it is going to be um, a luxury experience. That's what it's going to have to be. Because like as Jason's saying, that she's used to having someone come to her house now. You know, and that consumer confidence of them coming back is going to take a long time for that to happen. It really is. If you ask any, any if Salon tells me, if I ask them, how are you guys doing? And they say, oh, my God, we're doing great. I'm like, you're a liar. <laughs> because right. not everybody is doing great. Right. Right. And you're not special. <laughs> you know, you may be doing OK, but you're not doing great because that's a lie. There's no way that the, you're you're at the same level that you were before the pandemic. It's impossible. And, I think, and we've had conversations yeah. with the most famous hairdressers in the world. And everyone is saying the same thing, that it's a scary, challenging time. And, you know, thinking about how we're going to reinvent through this is really critical. And that's what's important is us to reinvent it. We have to reinvent it. We can't think of business as usual or business the way that it was before the pandemic, because it's not going to be. The world is not going to be throughout the social unrest, throughout the pandemic, through all the changes that are gonna have happen in government, everything is changed and it's not going to be the same. So we have to be, all of us as entrepreneurs, we have to be forward thinking and what that's going to be like. And I do wanna say something that if you feel like that your business is an anchor weight, drop it, drop it. Kill her. Yeah. I closed my salon for that very reason. Absolutely. We are too. Three of them. Absolutely. For that very, very, very same reason. So don't feel like that you cannot move forward with your life if you are unhappy. We have a good friend of ours that is a, a, in the fitness business and she is, she was struggling with that for like the last year or so, you know, and we had many, many, many conversations about it. And she finally decided that she's not going to go forward with her business in a brick and mortar because her online business is so successful. So don't have, you guys, don't have that anchor weight on you if you feel like that you are struggling in a way that is making you miserable and that you're fighting with your husband or your wife and your kid, you know, everything is just miserable in your life. Let it go. And just because something isn't going the right way, just because you have to close your salon, it doesn't mean you failed. It's just a chapter that's closing and another chapter is opening. And that chapter can be brand new, anything that you want it to be. You guys have touched on so many things over what you just said. You talked about how you need one, have courage to take a risk. And one of the best pieces of advice that you said here today, and you said all kinds of great advice was that you should say yes to pretty much everything. I think say yes to everything when you're, especially when you're just getting started. We have this notion, maybe this, this almost, I don't know, a part of the industry is telling us that we should charge what we're worth. But you know what? At the beginning of our careers, 
we're not worth anything because <laughs> right. we don't have the experience. <laughs> so don't pretend like, well, I got a license, so I'm worth all this money now. Not until you prove yourself, right? Just because you went to school doesn't mean that you're ready to start charging $100 a haircut or more or, or anything like that. We need to prove ourselves. And in order to prove ourselves, we need to say yes to so many opportunities, any opportunities that are coming at us, even if it's free a lot of times to begin with, because we can build our books, we can meet the right people, we can, we might not ever have these opportunities again. You were lucky, Ted, that you got horsed to push you over and over again, say, you got to go to New York. You got to go to New York. What if he just stopped after the first time? I, I mean, know. I wouldn't you, be you where probably I still would have been successful, but yeah. it might have taken longer. Absolutely. Or would have been completely different. You know, I think that what horse, you know, having a mentor, I've had several in my life and I still have a coach. Her name is Zan Ray. And Zan, you know, we don't necessarily make any major decisions without really talking to her. And we make major decisions every single day, it seems mm -hmm. like. But having someone who can not only make you feel good, but tell you when you're an asshole at the same time. You and know? help navigate, and those, having tricky navigate those tricky things. You know, I think it's important for all of us to have that and, you know, to have someone that you can trust and someone that you can bounce ideas off of and that you can go to that can make a difference in your life. And I, I've had that, you know, I'm, I'm a definite opportunist, 100%. I know that when I decided that I wanted to be a hairdresser and I wanted to work at Zans in Austin, Texas back in 1989, 1989, and I wanted to work for her, I have to tell you that I would call I would call, I would call, I would show up, I would call, I would show up, I would call, I show up because I knew that there was something that she had that I needed and wanted, that I knew that there was something there that I needed to have in order for me to grow. And I was going to get it. And I did. I did. And it was the same thing with Horst. So I've had those experiences that I think are really, really, really vital in the success that I've had. And, you know, my parents, my mom, you know, they were very, very strict on me. And I think that those core values of who I am as a person helped to navigate uh, my career and my life. So I'm very fortunate. Amazing. There's one other thing I want to touch on, and then we can touch on anything that you wanted that we forgot about or you want to, want to highlight that we may um, haven't spoken about yet. I want to hear about this Ted Gibson experience. And so say I go and I go to your website or the app or however I decide to become one of your probably elite clients. I'm like, I want the $2,400 Ted Gibson experience. What can I expect? What can you expect? I would probably say that you wouldn't expect anything different than coming to you for a haircut ride. Well, I don't know. I don't cut hair in a cloud. No, I, I but, but, but what I'm saying is, is that my $2,400 haircut is an experience, yes. And what you get for that experience is that you book an appointment and how you book the appointment is you have to go through Jason, you pay a deposit. After you pay that deposit, <laughs> um, you're vetted, right? Because you're vetted. Mm -hmm. And then you come in for your experience. And for me, it's about the consultation. The consultation is the most vital in how we build our relationship as a client and um, as a service provider, how we build that relationship. And the consultation is the most important thing because I think that getting a great haircut, you can get that anywhere. It's not really about necessarily my haircut is better than anyone else's because I'm a great hairdresser, but there are a lot of great hairdressers. But what I am able to bring is myself. Well, and I think that Ted has literally perfected the art of being able to see someone's beauty differently than she sees it herself. You know, Ted's, there's not many people who have been publicly transforming women in the way that Ted has for this long, you know, like from what not to wear, where he was making over women every week on a television show for five years or six years, whatever it was, to cutting bangs on Annie Hathaway for The Devil Wears Prada, to, you know, Kate Goslin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm Kate Goslin from that, we put <laughs> extensions in her hair and like changed her life. 
<laughs> hey, you know, truth bombs. I, you know what I mean? I, I can yeah. go from, from, you know, and thank you, Jason. And I can go from, you know, the A-list star to the reality star. I mean, and it doesn't matter the color of the skin. Like, I didn't care if you were black or white or Asian or Latina or Indian. It didn't matter to me. To me, it was all about the textures of hair and what I can do to create the most beautiful hair. So I think that, you know, thank you for that, Jason. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Well, I know how to sell that. Fuck. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're selling it without selling it without selling it. Said, I know how to yeah. sell that in haircut. Twenty four hundred dollars. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 my mom's gonna be mad she's gonna be sad <laughs> <laughs> i was doing so good too <laughs> you know i and thank you thanks again jason because i i feel like that my that's what i was put on this planet to do Ryan. you know i i love the ingenue i love to be able to show a woman or a man what something different than they don't see in themselves. And I think that's what a true artist is about. There was this moment that Ashley Green, she was one of the kids in the Twilight series. Alice, I think was her name in Twilight. I never saw the movies, but so Ted was working with her and I was coloring her hair and we became friends. And there was this moment, I think that she was going to the Met Gala <laughs> and we were all in an apartment waiting for her to get there to start the, I guess the glam. I hate that they call it the glam now, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And to see this young 20 something girl come in off the street with her hair in a ponytail in jeans and a leather jacket and a t-shirt and just looking like a regular pretty girl on the street and watching the whole process of the stylist putting her clothes on and Ted doing the hair, and I don't remember who was doing makeup. Julie Harris. Julie Harris did her makeup. And seeing this girl turn into a movie star, like the process of, you know, taking her from, you know, a vulnerable 22 year old or however old she was at the time kid to being able to step out on the red carpet at the Met Gala with all of the confidence in the world knowing that everyone is going to be looking at her, judging her, you know, that kind of armor that that process gives her and Ted being able to do that for an everyday woman who comes in off the street, but her daughter's getting married or she's switching to a new job or whatever that moment is to have that experience with Ted is like really profound for them. You know, it's like, that's what you get is you get, 25 years of experience in making women feel beautiful and confident for a $2,400 haircut. And it's almost like you're connecting with their soul to yeah. make them feel confident in the beautiful person that they are. And you were just talking about the experience about, you know, coming out of beauty school and thinking you can charge hundred dollars for a haircut. I understand that. I get that, that, you know, because people look at Instagram, we're all influenced by the same thing. But, but I do believe that there is something about that experience, right? Of being able to really know and guide them into what you know is going to be best for them. And we don't have that from the beginning. I didn't have that from the beginning. That, that's taken years of perfecting who I am as an artist to create that, those moments, because they're always moments. They're moments of a woman's life. If you ask a woman of a certain age, you ask her, okay, so tell me about what did you what you were when you were 33. She goes, well, my hair was this. And she that, always she's always her hair defined. Was. She's <laughs> defined by those moments of her hair. She goes, oh my God, that's what I had, thanks. Oh my God, oh my God, I was blonde. <laughs> oh, I was redhead. You know, so it's always those moments of hair that define women. And I think that women have different periods of their life. And I know for me as an artist, which I've had to come in ter to terms with, is that I am with actresses for periods of their life. And just like clients in the salon, just like clients you know, in we the don't salon. keep, rarely do we keep them forever. Yeah. You know, like a, a good client relationship is probably three years, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and then we kind of outgrow each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we either have to fire them or they fire us and move on to someone else, you know? And yeah, it's the same with the celebrities, you know? It's like the relationship is 
great when it is, and then it then it's over. Yeah. You know, that's a tough one for Ted. He falls in love with them. I don't fall in love with them anymore. <laughs> I used to fall in love with them. I don't fall in love with them anymore. You can't. I can love them. You can't. But right. I don't fall in love with them. There's right, a- guys. You've been. It's been incredible to have you here. You've been humble, kind, so easy to talk to, and you just inspire me and you inspire our entire industry. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wrapping up here. So your products starring by Ted Gibson are available on Amazon, right? They are. They are. For consumer. And then you can also shop professional. Our website. Go to our website starring by Ted Gibson. We're actually launching our new website tomorrow. I don't know when when you're going to share this interview, but our new website tomorrow is what? The 19th? Oh, 18, 18, 18, yes. So December it's usually 18. about a, a few weeks turnaround with the episode. So by that point, the new website will probably be up and I'll make sure I put a link to it in our show notes on Ryan Okay, great, yeah. Thank you. And tell me about this real quickly. Tell me about this shooting star texture meringue. That just, I just love the name and I, I feel like I want some, I want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's meringue, it's meringue consistency. Um, it's a hybrid between a mousse and a foam. So if, for those of you who have used a mousse, you know how it can be really sticky and alcoholy and, and you can't maneuver it very much after it dries. Or you used a foam and a foam tends to be really watery and it doesn't give the oomph that you really, really love. This is right in between. So what I love about Shooting Star Text Meringue is that I've used it on just every single celebrity. If you go to my Instagram at Ted Gibson or if you go to at Starring on Instagram, you can see all of the hair that we've done with Shooting Star Text Meringue. It is Fabulous because it smells like fig and coconut and amber. It's very provocative fragrance. And then you can use it on wet hair for a voluminous, sexy blow dry, which I love because I love a really great blow dry. And then if you put in some beach waves or you put in some curls, you put it in after that and it creates this really beautiful texture. It'd be great in your hair, actually. I'd love to try some. Yeah. I might be going on Amazon after this. All good. right. Good. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have to go in there. <laughs> All right. Else is going yeah. send, me, send me a signed bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and it's lovely. It's really, really I use it. It's so on different set, than anything else. Anything too. else. Because a lot of a lot of styling products give like a conditioning sort of slip to the hair. And this gives the hair, like you'll feel it when you're blow drying. It gives it a toughness. Yeah. You know, so instead of like a soft, silky limpness. It gives it like a bold kind of toughness that is still soft. It's, we call it a matte shine. So instead of an oily looking shine, it's like very light reflective, but not oily looking. So we call it matte shine. And so it has a a really different finish probably than anyone has experienced before. And I think, you know, it's fun for hairdressers to play with it and really figure out how they're going to be able to use it. And the people that have been the most successful with it are the people who try it on everything, you know, because it is such a versatile product and it is unlike anything else. So it's fun to play with. I'm sold. (laughs) Of hairspray. Uh I simply use it if I'm on set, I use it in place place of hairspray. I feel like there should be like this timer on the clock now. If you buy in the next 10 minutes, you can get <laughs> next, a second one free. Why did we learn? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, it, and you're in the back there styling, showing, look at the moose in action. Here we go. Look at what you can but do you with the hair. You can flip it this way, flip it that way. But you know what I will do uh, is that your audience um, goes and they send us a message at info at tedgibson.com. Send us a message that they purchased a case of Shooting Star Text from Rain. We, or I, will do a 30-minute Zoom with them, just like what we're doing. With uh-huh. their salon team. With their salon team, if you buy just one case. No way. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to be like, this is, this is recorded. <laughs> like, I didn't say that. No. Here's the transcript. Here's the minute marker that you said that. Okay. Yeah. That, that's that's, in, that's so incredible much. of you. And I, I can't wait to share this with the, with the world. And you are probably going to have some people that are going to be buying some cases of that. And they're going to be yeah, shouting you so be The best 30 minutes and the best investment you've made in a really long time. Maybe I'll just buy like 12 cases and I'll just say, like, all right, that's, that's 12 Zooms. <laughs> 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 thank you guys so so much for being oh, here today i pleasure. really appreciate thank you, you. Yeah, it's really fun too thank you thank very you much. you got it i love hearing from you and by the way have you subscribed to the podcast yet oh my gosh if you haven't please do so right now because there's so much cool stuff ahead 
make sure you hit that subscribe button because it would be much cooler if you did. Plus, I don't want you to miss any of the new episodes I'm dropping weekly. Last thing, if you haven't checked out RyanWeedon.com yet, there are some great freebies on there that I want to give you. So go ahead and check it out, RyanWeedon.com. Thank you so much for listening. You are awesome.